I'm Richard Charlesworth. This is Millen. Um, and uh, as Steve mentioned, um, uh, until uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was the CIO for the Tennessee Department of Education, uh, where uh, I was suckered into leaving my home state of Texas to come up to join a mission uh, by my former commissioner with a very simple sentence. So he sat me down and gave me his, his and the governor's vision, which was simply put, to transform the Department of Education from a compliance-centered delivery organization to one of actual real value delivery. So recognizing, one, that uh, DOEs, um, the world is changing, and DOEs need to find a new, more relevant place in the mix, uh, and empowering districts is a major, major first step. Um, that, was, that was compelling and started the process, which ended up with this solution. So I wanted to start this conversation. I know we don't have an education audience, so I'll try not to get um, too wonky on this. Uh, but I wanted to frame the challenge in the K-12 sector, because um, I think it's really important to understand the value of the solution that ended up getting developed. Because the technology itself is very exciting. But I think the impact that it has on the market uh, and ultimately downstream on real people, real students, real teachers, is the part that, that is really exciting. So this is a very, very common slide. We hear this all the time in the ed sector. There's not enough data. We need to know more. Um, Walgreens down the street collects more data about its customers than we do about our students. I've seen that quote used so many times. The problem is it's not true. We collect a tremendous amount of data in education, right? Um, the problem is it's really hard for the people who actually need it, teachers, to get to it when they need it in an easy way that's contextually relevant to what they're doing, right? It is scattered across silos and multiple systems um, that teachers frequently don't have access to or the, the methods that they have to go through to get access are really, really cumbersome and challenging. It's also scattered across organizations, right? Schools, districts, private NGOs, the state, the federal government, uh, you name it. And this landscape crosses lots of organizations who aren't terribly good at talking to each other. Um, and I totally preempted that slide. <laughs> so I'm just going to skip it. All right, so this is um, a, represent a representation of what the data and systems landscape looks like in your average school district. Um, and Tennessee is a great analog for every other state, right? Um, so you have all of this information there in all these silos. These are all individual applications. Um, and they don't talk to each other. They've all got different authentication layers, different data layers, sometimes even different definitions of the same data set. Um, and so we end up with this really fractured experience for the teacher, and we also end up with the fractured truth. So each one of these systems may have the same data in it, and they never match, because they've all got a different viewpoint. They've got a different time dimension. They've got a different context. It may not have been updated. It may have been updated, and the other ones haven't. And so we find ourselves in situations where we're telling educators to go be more data-driven. right? We're ramping up the accountability on them as well. Um, but when they go out into this ecosystem to try to find the information they need to better inform empowering that student, they run into all these challenges, and then when they expend the Herculean effort to actually get access to the data, they don't trust it because so frequently the truth is fractured too. So what we're all trying to get to and what every teacher, if you sit them down and ask, can, if you waved a magic wand, what would your IT reality look like, is this. What we've been calling the single pane of glass experience, right? Teachers don't care how hard this is. Right? They just want access to what they need when they need it as quickly as possible. And this is really important. We discovered 
they want to see it in the same place as other data because they, as human beings in this human enterprise, make contextual uh, connections um, that have real impact on their ability to connect with students, right? So they want to see things in the same pane of glass, right? Um, the other thing that I, I want to point out is that in our industry, 100% um, of all value delivered happens at the intersection of these three actors. Um, I used to tell my team, if you're not a student, a teacher, or a parent, then your supply chain, not a customer, right? Um, and so we had this big task of changing from compliance-centered, which doesn't actually care about any of those actors, right? Still important, we gotta have accountability, um, to focusing on delivering value to this exchange. So there's a couple of quick numbers I wanna throw out before we get to the actual technical uh, good part. Um, 50. Just a good number. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, <laughs> I know that because I'm a product of public education. Um, no, so this last uh, fall, I was having a conversation with a teacher. Um, we'll call her Diane in a district that I won't name, Memphis. Um, and I asked her, how many different logins do you have to manage to do your job? And 50 was her answer. 50 for a profession, think about that. And does anybody in the room have a uh, wife or husband that is an educator? If you do, raise your hand, there you go. Have you heard this story before? A little bit. I'm sure the number's different. It was a much smaller number. Good. Okay, so, so your wife works for a very progressive district. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. Good, awesome. Um, so this, this is not an average by any stretch of the imagination, but in a, in a large urban district, this is not actually unusual, right? Then I asked her, all right, so if you've got 50 logins, you're not using all 50. Like, that's just not fit, humanly possible. What do you actually use on a daily basis? Six. I can't do the five and without dropping. <laughs> um, so six, that is a tremendous amount of wasted effort and opportunity, right? Oh, and also, where is that 50 being stored? Oh, um, in the most secure place there is, underneath the keyboard on a post-it note. <laughs> um, so uh, another quick set of numbers. Um, um, it would be really cool anecdotally if this happened recently as well, but this conversation I actually had two years ago with a tech director in a school district I won't name. Um, and um, I asked him, or I didn't ask him, he told me with, without me asking, um, one of the challenges that he had, dealt, he had dealt with recently. He had 400 new teachers that started that year. And they all had to start on the same day. They had to be provisioned to get going, right? And I said, well, how many people did you have to handle that? And he said, two. Uh, and I said, well, so is that your help desk? Or, you know, were you able to pull in people, you know, engineers, et cetera, from other places in your IT department? He said, no, no, that's our IT department, two. And I'm one of those two. <laughs> That's not an uncommon scenario either. This is, this is the realities of the K-12 industry. Now, that's not just one account. Remember our, our number 50? Now, he doesn't have 50 applications running around with different logins in his organization, um, but, he, but he does have a baker's dozen or so, right? And so the reality is they didn't get done provisioning their teachers to start teaching until almost Thanksgiving. That's real in the trenches. All right, so um, this is a very busy slide, which is great, because it's, it's about regulation, which is busy. <laughs> so in 
So in, in the education sector, we have a law called FERPA, which is not just K-12, it also applies to higher ed. Uh, but it's a really fun law, it's very similar to HIPAA. Anybody in healthcare gets to deal with HIPAA? Couple, um, I, see the, uh, I see the stress. Um, so FERPA is just like HIPAA in that the law is incredibly detailed and specific about how you're going to be punished and immensely vague on what compliance actually means. FERPA is exactly the same thing, right? Which is great for consultants. It's a whole cottage industry around that. <laughs> um, but the, the net effect for a school district in the trenches is to err on the side of caution. And what that means is if there is a question on whether or not this teacher should have access to this data, this data that she makes a usually legitimate claim will empower her to be a better teacher. If there is any possible question or any misunderstanding or concern about being able to provide audit, the answer is no. And so when we went out and we deployed teacher dashboards, which we'll talk about a little bit later, with this identity platform empowered, we asked teachers, what's the number one most valuable immediate thing that you got from this tool? And we were shocked and embarrassed at the answer because the answer was mom and dad's phone number, right? Um, it's not that the district doesn't have it. Um, I actually counted the number of times I filled in my own phone number when I registered my kids last year. It was seven. Um, and then a, a final eighth per teacher, right? Because the systems and the districts frequently err on the side of not giving that information to teachers because they're afraid of this compliance. And the reason is because in most, and in, in, it is FERPA, but it's also, and now that I don't work for a state, I can also bang on the state a little bit. States contribute to this compliance nightmare as well. Um, it's based on relationships. So it's this real vague contextual educational relevance that's based on relationships uh, between the, the, the student or the data um, the person that that data is about and the person requesting the data, right? And uh, it sounds like a fairly simple thing, but it gets really complex and it changes. It's in constant flux, right? So building systems that can manage this in real time and tease out this complexity really, really fast is a hard thing to do, didn't exist, and so the net effect is it's just easier to say no. No, nope, you don't get access to it. You gotta ask mom and dad to write it on, a, on a, an index card. And, and not only that, but if you don't centralize the FERPA compliance, right? You, you have all these disparate applications implementing their own version of FERPA compliance, now you don't have consistency, right? And so if you can centralize that, that authorization mechanism, now you have something, right? So that's, that's another big piece of this. Um, so a little bit about FERPA, and this is the, the, the most basic uh, visualization of FERPA uh, we, we slapped together. But um, on one case, I am an application trying to access data on behalf of a user, and my application has access to a local education agency or, or district, as it's commonly termed. And that LEA has these schools within it, these, these schools in that district, and within those schools, I have these students enrolled, right? So FERP is basically saying, okay, well, if that's the relationship, then those are the only students that you can access. You can't access any of the other students outside of your purview. Um, and so if you take that down another notch and you take that to a more granular level, it turns into, oh, well, I'm a teacher. And as a teacher, I teach these three classes. And inside of those three classes, I have these students, and those are the only students that I can see, right? Or you say, I'm a counselor and I'm at the school and now I can see all of the students within that school. Right? So that's, that's a very basic thing. But as we talk about data at an identity conference, right? this, is, this is a really important thing. We're using the identity to enable us to enforce FERPA. It's a very crucial piece in how these, how these two pieces of data and identity tie together. So even in this really simple example, uh, there are a number of use cases where this relationship would change. Substitute teacher. Um, what happens when there's a substitute teacher that comes in in most schools? It's, the kids are excited. It's thrilling because I'm not going to do anything because that teacher doesn't have access to anything. 
They don't even know my name. They gotta ask me. I can make up things. This is what my daughter tells me. I was a princess today. I told her I was Elsa. <laughs> right? And it's not because we don't trust substitute teachers. They are also teachers. It's because the, the challenges of being able to quickly turn on a dime and present to them the same, the same tool set that a standard teacher needs is, is up until now, maybe that's an early reveal, um, is just simply too challenging. Okay, so this is what, what my team um, um, lovingly refers to as the hamburger, Rich, or Richard's hamburger. Um, so um, I'm sure we're, there's a lot of engineers in the room, so um, um, this is the part where I get embarrassed when I say, this is our enterprise architecture drawing. Um, I had to cartoon it up a little bit. It works a little bit better with the executives and the legislators. Um, but the, the basic pieces are there, right? So, uh, so we, we remember back to um, the, the fundamental vision of our transformation in Tennessee was to change from compliance driven to value delivery driven. Um, we went out, we, we discovered these challenges, uh, some of them we've, we've talked about, um, and we sat down and we said, all right, we have carte blanche permission to kind of redraw the problem. This is a great opportunity. What do we do? One of the things that we realized is that identity is actually the beginning of the fracturing of everything, right? Um, identity traditionally is handled after data and application, right? So we decided that we wanted to think of identity as both a platform and a service, and also as a foundational element for everything else to be based upon. Because, as we discovered, we're actually in the identity business. All of our data and all of our transactions are identity wrapped and identity centered. So we wanted a common identity platform. Does this have a little laser? Is that what red does? Cool. Um, and starts there, and um, we had a vision for this being able to provide single sign-on, automatic provisioning, those kinds of things that you know, really help out kind of the operational side. But remember, we had to deal in this scenario where we had a lot of different organizations, right? We're crossing all these organizational boundaries. So when you think about implementing these kind of integrated solutions in an enterprise, we had 147 enterprises and only 50 of them even had a directory, right? Um, that's, the, that's the reality as well. Not to mention app vendors need to come into the space, and so it's really, really complex, and it's gotta be done in a way that is independent of those organizational boundaries. So, um, that was also a requirement. Um, we also wanted to be able to bridge and broker connections, right? So, um, um, if you've, you know, you've got an application or you're already in another identity space um, and we, want, we, want to be able, we wanted to be able to be a bridge to connect those so that you could consume um, and build a kind of ever-evolving custom portfolio of capability and applications delivered over the cloud and that, that school districts weren't um, anchored and, and forced into a single ecosystem by the identity platforms that they chose, right? So we could act as that, that central hub. Um, we could also act as this is the federal government over here. Um, I really liked working with them. Um, and so we could also broker the relationships with them and feed the data and maintain a chain of custody all along the way. Um, what are some of the other dreams that we had of the data platform? There were a lot. Yeah. We'll get into them because yeah. um, that's why we're here. Yeah. So the rest of that, um, I could go into it, but it'll bore you. But basically, um, um, <laughs> also, uh, I hope there's no data people in, in the room because uh, I use the, frame, the phrase master data management. Um, it is not. Um, but my bosses and people understood that as, oh, well, that's the master of the data management, right? That's the, that's the big guy, that's standardization. So we use that as an analog for standardization. And also being able to what we called architect a single source of the truth, right? So we wanted to trust in the data was really, really important. And so we wanted to bring these platforms together and present an environment where it was physically impossible 
for there to be more than one version of the truth. Goals of the platform, yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna give you the clicker because well, I, I keep jumping to the next to slide. No, that's fine. Um, so as, as Richard talked about, there's, there's some core tenets of what we needed to get out of this platform for Tennessee. Um, so one was to create a single sign-on infrastructure for state, district, and school staff, including teachers, primarily teachers was obviously Richard's concern, right? And trying to improve that, that relationship uh, between the teacher and the student impacting student outcome. Um, but also the other administrators, the counselors, the principals, you know, superintendents and so on. Um, we needed a unique identification system for students and staff. We needed a person identifier, right? The, the common, what we like to refer to as the common link, right? What is, what is the ID? You would be amazed, amazed at how many districts and states still use an SSN to identify the students, right? An SSN today, that's 2000, is it 15? 15. So Clarksville I, Montgomery School District last year had to pay out $3.5 million because they got hacked. And that hacker got the, the student ID numbers of all the students, which were social security numbers. Right. And so they had to buy credit protection for effectively every resident of the county. Right, because they probably also had the SSNs of the parents, too. Um, yeah, and teachers and yeah, everybody. Right. The, why go halfway, just do it all. Right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we needed, we needed a unique identification system specific for the school system. Just like DMV has a driver's license number and just like you've got, I don't know, um, student, student IDs in a, in a proper school system. And then obviously a, a statewide data infrastructure. This goes back to FERPA, right? We needed a statewide data infrastructure for these applications to share that data in one common source of truth and then wrap security controls around all of that. And so that's where all of this came from. And we won't dive into all of this. We'll, we'll focus on some main components, okay. but I just want to describe this infrastructure for you because it's, it's all linked together. So um, use my little red dot. There we go. OK, so up here you have applications like uh, grade books and attendance modules that teachers use to log information about their students, right? And um, down here, they want to, we, you know, these, these applications are storing all of this data in these proprietary data formats where application A can't apply, access application B's data, and that's why Richard had to re enter his contact information eight different times for his, for his kids. So these applications are still storing data in some proprietary data store somewhere. But what we also set up was a statewide. Um, uh, data store built on EdFi, which is an open data standard. And we wanted to get these applications to also store the same data that they're storing in their system here in this open data standard, in this, in this database. And so what we did was we built a REST API that really all the, all the API does is provide a security layer around that database so that this application can only access a certain set of data, as we talked about going back to the FERPA slides, only access a certain set of application that they should have a purview into, right? That they can read a certain set of application or a certain set of data and that they can write a certain set of data. We also have a unique ID subsystem back here, which Tennessee was able to license out from another state. This is a person identifier. This goes back to just having a unique identification system so that um, a user can go into their, their integrated application and they can type in a first name and last name and other information about a student and ask the system, is there a unique ID, a student ID already created for the student? No, there isn't? Okay, I wanna create one. And all those person IDs is what we like to call them are stored here. And so, you know, there's XML and JSON and they can send their data back and forth to the REST API. We've got FimSync and SSO, automatically provisioning accounts. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, off of this, this is a major, major, major cost saving to the districts, uh, to the tune of 50 bucks a student per year. You would not believe how much accountability data costs districts and taxpayers. And so giving the state 
a central data store to pull data out of for accountability reporting is a huge cost saving. I remember we were in Arizona and the CIO of Tennessee was saying, if we had this infrastructure, or they're on the way of build, getting this. So I should say, when we had this infrastructure in place, he said, we're estimated to save 40 to $60 million per year across the districts, every year. So this is, this is a big thing. Um, that and was then, Arizona that said that. I'm sorry? Yeah, who did I say? Masterson. You said I said it. Oh, Arizona. Sorry. Which I did say it, but I was saying you it did after say that. you said it. <laughs> did I just point the red pointer at you? I think I did. That's weird. All right, so then we had a data warehouse uh, for longitudinal data and reporting, and then visualizations for the, for the teachers, because as Richard had talked about, these teachers have to log into all these separate systems to access assessment data here, grade data here, attendance there. Um, and if they could just have one place to pull in all that data in one aggregate form, they'd love it, right? So we provided some dashboards. So that's, that's the whole picture. We'll dive into these piece by piece. So once again, unique ID system, super important. This is, this is the central point, central jump off point to create identity as a service. We need a unique, a unique ID system to uniquely identify staff and students. From there, we integrate um, a central data store and have the applications integrate to, to send and receive data. This is also one of the starting points for provisioning accounts. You can go into uh, a system, let's say an HR system, and you can now enter in a staff member and say, hey, this new staff member just joined our district. And here's the district or the school that they, they, have, they should have access to. That data hits the central data store. And then from there, FimSync automatically picks it up, says, hey, I have just found a new staff member. Haven't seen the staff member before. I also see they have an email address. I'm going to automatically provision an SSO account for the staff member, and I'm going to send them an email and welcome them to the SSO. Um, and obviously, you've got your self-service password reset and multi-factor authentication built in, right? The wonders of the Microsoft platform. And once again, we're using unique ID as the common link. So, now I can build applications that integrate with the SSO. And as they forward users over to the SSO and that user logs in successfully, currently that application is, you know, the SSO redirects back to that application with one claim on it. And that claim is the unique ID. And with that unique ID, that application can look at it, uniquely identify the staff member, bounce that off of the API and, and say, hey, API, I have this unique ID. Tell me more about this staff member. Really no different than if you um, have integrated with Facebook for authentication before, LinkedIn for authentication before. They return back to you an ID for that person, and then you bounce off their API to give you more profile information. Um, so diving into this a little bit more, uh, Frank, thank you for the slide. I think you're the one that, that built this. So yeah, flipping we, the diagram. We stole this slide from uh, Oxford. Yes. Uh, I was saying borrow. I was being a little nicer. Oh. But you said well, steal, so that'll work. Well, All right. we, we did pay you. <laughs> so I guess it's not theft. <laughs> so really, we bought this slide. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, so claims aware application, that's once again the, the vendor application integrating with um, the, um, the identity as a service. They, the user attempts to log in real time. It hits the uh, database, the central data store that I showed you before, and says, hey, I've got this username. What unique ID do you have tied to that? And it responds back with the appropriate claim saying, here's this person. They successfully logged in, and here's their unique ID. We also have you know, somewhere in this section, which is off the screen, we have the API writing staff members and students here, and FimSync automatically provisioning accounts. And then, um, Richard, you want to talk about O3C5 and the federated? Yeah. Um, so um, we had a whole bunch of wild ideas and requirements for if we're going to do an identity platform. Like, let's you know, sky's the limit. One of the things that we wanted to do that many districts in, in Tennessee had actually asked us for was they wanted to jump in feet first into the O365 space. 
but again, you know, with two I, with two IT people and half of that uh, uh, FTE count being managers, right? Um, even the provisioning of something as streamlined as Office 365 gets challenging, right? And so we wanted, as a state, to be able to offer turnkey, flip on a switch, provisioning of Office 365. And with this identity platform in place, it's actually a fairly trivial step, right? Um, uh, oh, that's that's, that's a, a great use case example for what we meant by being a broker in the middle to connect this. All right, so I'll, I'll just jump into a couple of uh, super, super quick videos. Um, and this was... It's weird having my head on the screen. I'm going to step over here. All right, so this is, this is a vendor application interacting with the REST API. Um, and in education, you have to understand the context that, in Richard's words, this had never been done before. Right? Here I am in a student information system, which is essentially the CRM for uh, a school or school district, and I'm adding a staff member and giving them an email address, right? just like they normally do. Um, and in real time, going off, let's see here, uh, assigning a statewide identifier, interacting with the API to search for and, I, and assign a statewide identifier to that staff member. So we're creating a, a new identity for that staff member. And at this point, I now have a staff member in my student information system that would normally be stored in that you know, uh, proprietary data store. But now, with the integration with the, that API, we're sending that staff member off to the API to store it in the central data store. Um, and then, as part of the FERPA compliance, giving them an association with, in this case, a district, and making them, I think, what are we doing here? Making them a superintendent? Yes. And so that creates the relationship. Now this person should be able to see data within the, um, within the entire district. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit. A little bit more. OK. So automatically, they get this, the staff member gets this email. Your Active Directory account has been created. Go log in. And now I can use a single sign-on with that username and password, temporary password, sign in, and we are off and running. So we showed this to a group of, was it 20, 23 uh, education organizations at a, a summit hosted by the EdFi Alliance, which is part of the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. And what's a good word to explain their reaction? Um, sudden standing ovation. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, it, it, I, I, I came out of the enterprise space, too. Uh, there are pieces of this that I'm sure some of you are going, well, I mean, we've done that, right? That's, you know, that's, that's part of why we're in this room, is we, at some point in the past, got serious about building this, this in. Some things that you need to understand are, one, <laughs> yeah. Well, guess what? K-12 is a little bit behind. Like, this has literally never been done, right? Um, two, um, there's multiple organizations, in, even involved in just this, this one simple step, right? Um, classes were created. Schedules were created. Students were assigned to a class. Teachers were assigned to a class. And then that student information system went, oh, that teacher, who I know is now a teacher, because the definition of teacher I know is somebody who has a class that has actual students in it, right, um, is not actually provisioned as a teacher. I'm just going to go ahead and do that, because otherwise, how are they going to get access to the teacher tools? Does it all automatically. And at the end of it, the teacher actually gets a, gets a login and gets provisioned uh, and now has access into this broad environment uh, that includes both the student information system and also this teacher dashboard. And that was all done um, across multiple organizational boundaries, and the school district didn't own a single asset in the entire chain. They didn't have any control over anything. Um, that's massive. It's huge. Um, so, and, and expanding on that, the, the list of benefits, right? Um, number one, by having this, by having single sign-on, this is stuff, once again, 
you guys already know, but in the K-12 space, this is a really big deal that no more post-it notes under a keyboard, right? Because the teacher only needs that one login. Well, at least uh, ones with passwords. I think sorry? I, at least ones with passwords written on them. Yes. I think 3M is still safe in the education community. There's <laughs> post-it notes are very popular. Right. <laughs> um, application vendors obviously don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, uh, this is, once again, something you guys already know as well, building uh, password reset functionality, multi-factor authentication, um, and just flat out having to store a bunch of passwords. They just don't have to worry about that anymore. Problem solved, right? So that's great. Um, burning cost to school districts is greatly reduced. Um, so this is a big one, right? We talked about how the, the example of the 402, right? The 400 staff members that were joining in a week and the two IT people that were there to create all of their accounts and it took months to provision all of that. Right? Um, but there's also, um, going back, let me go back here. Richard, how many staff members did you have? CIO of Tennessee, the state Department of Education, how many staff members did you have? Um, like including secretaries and stuff? Yeah. Nine. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's the face I made when I first showed up to work, too. <laughs> Nine. And, and how many, how many? You should ask me how many, de how many of those were developers? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Like how many, how, how many people that could do infrastructure and stand up this kind of system? Zero. Okay. What was your server farm look like? Um, pretty old, dusty. Um, Plugged in? Yes, no? no? Okay. No, no blinking lights. We're <laughs> blinking light free. Um, one of the things that we failed to mention is that literally everything that we've just talked about um, From the data warehouse to identity to to, um, to even uh, hosting student information systems for most of the state of Tennessee and also the teacher dashboard, 100% Azure um, um, with all the cloudy goodness uh, involved in that. In fact, significant chunks of the identity platform leverage um, tool sets that are in Azure. Um, and, and dramatically reduce the cost, uh, but also um, the, the scalability benefits are just so hard to, to overstate here because it's a very spiky uh, industry, right? And uh, don't have a lot of assets uh, to throw around. So at the end of the day, um, we, I think, I think we, we started... Uh, we had conversations about bringing a ping pong table into our server room or because there were no servers left in it anymore and we completely moved to the cloud the other thing is this entire ecosystem we talked about cost savings and you mentioned the 50 bucks a kid just on the id um, we actually presented at south by southwest um, uh, last year and uh, we did some some quick calculations on the total savings uh, for just Tennessee school districts in this solution, and it was enough to buy a new tablet computer for every single student in the entire state every single year. Now, that's not what they did with the savings, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, but it's these kinds of market changes have the potential to drive those kinds of dramatic changes in real people's lives. Um, the other thing that I think is important to mention is this entire process um, um, would not have been possible without Oxford and without the relationship bet between Oxford and Microsoft. So a quick little anecdote, and I hope I'm not, I'm not embarrassing you guys, although I'm probably not going to stop. Um, there, we, when we had this vision for this identity platform, this brokerage kind of vision for identity, um, we started shopping it around, right? And we had race to the top money, some grant money. Um, you may have heard of it. We had half a billion dollars to play with, although I didn't get it. Um, but we had money, right? And people knew we had money. So we got a lot of people to listen to us, and we pitched and pitched and pitched. And we got one of two answers from everybody we talked to. Either, that's impossible, you're crazy, or how about you give me $9 million and I'll give it a shot, until Oxford came in the room. And we were so used to spending hours just getting people to even understand our vision. Um, we had blocked out a half of the entire day, sat in the conference room, and I think it was like 
maybe 30 minutes into it, there was this sudden, like, just, like, really uncomfortable, like, just silence. Because we didn't know what to do because, um, sorry, I'm calling you out. Um, Oxford's response was, well, that's odd that you would want to do that. But I think you could do it this way. And literally, in 25 minutes, we had had this architecture drawn out. And it's not that different from what it was in that, uh, in that moment. That kind of partner. Uh, and then also, downstream, as we developed the solution, Oxford worked with the Azure product group in Microsoft. And there were, there were changes prioritized and put into the, to the product development pipeline that showed up live in Azure production that were effectively built uh, for us. We were the first use case. Um, this would not physically have happened if we hadn't picked uh, Oxford as our partner. Sorry. So... Um, I don't know how to follow up applause. I don't know if I should just end. Um, uh, the, the other thing to, to touch on here is that, is stodgy a good word for explaining the ed tech market? I think it's really generous. Okay. So, so it's a very stodgy market, right? You've got these old systems, and I mean old, like systems that were written 20 years ago that were just kind of barely refactored, right? Usability isn't that great. Um, they don't integrate as we talked about. They're really expensive. One of them even as a SaaS priced out a cost of living increase. Yeah, um, that, was, that was one I got hit with. No, 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 we got to increase the cost of software. Well, why? Well, it's a cost of living increase. Are the tiny little people in your software, <laughs> did, did their property tax go up? <laughs> So it's, it's that kind of market. I mean, they really, I mean, you, you look at the amount of money that flows into, into education, the amount of money that the districts and states are, are spending to keep the ship afloat and trying to impact student outcomes. And there's really just a few big players that run the industry. And by having this kind of platform where you have a single sign-on, where you have a centralized data store, where you can just bring in a new vendor and say, hey, vendor, do you want access to this data? Great. Integrate with this platform. It's an open standard. Get permission from the district to access the data. And integrate with the SSO, and you are off and running. That's a very big departure from what we have today, or I should say prior to this platform, where if you're a student information system and you want to come in and supplant the one that's already there, you have to charge the district about 3 three fifty just to move the data from their system to your system. It's all forklift. It's, right. it's, I'm, I'm glad you touched on this. We, we, I probably should have started this at the beginning, but our, our real mission was to change a broken market. So one of the things that we saw quickly was that the K-12 market, particularly in the tech space, but also others, it is, it is a textbook definition of oligopoly uh, or cartel, right? Um, is a small group, I like cartel, it sounds, it sounds more devious. Um, it's really just an oligopoly. But um, there are big players that dominate, they have big systems, they've bundled everything, they've, they've forced their way in. Um, they've used the, the challenge of integration as a bludgeon to force um, deeper penetration into their customers. And the net effect has been um, K-12 is further behind everyone else. That's not just because K-12 has challenges managing and doing IT well. It's also because they suffer from their broken market. Um, we, again, we were at South By um, and wandering around and talking to all these, these really, really excited. South By EDU, just to clarify. South By Southwest, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't just wandering around at the film festival. I, I, I'd like to do that. Um, South by Southwest EDU, yes. And so we were having conversations with all these app vendors that were making these really cool little mobile apps and tiny kind of point in time stuff. And, um, um, and, and I would sit them down and ask, like, like, like what's your strategy? Right? You've, you know, you've got this kind of proof of concept. It's really cool. You're getting buzz. 
you know, how, how do you monetize this? How are you getting in? And my big question was, how do you connect, right? Because you need data out of this ecosystem and you know you're not gonna get cooperation. And nearly every single one of them, without a, without a skip, answered, oh, well, we're not planning on ever selling this. We, we, we developed this so that Pearson would buy us. <laughs> because that's the only way into the market. So, and I'm picking on Pearson, but there are, you know, there are other players in that oligopoly um, that it's, it's that locked in that even the innovative app developers uh, don't even attempt to sell it because they can't connect, right? Their hope is to be, to be incorporated as a feature set in the monolithic uh, sys environment. And so this platform also starts to pull apart that market and let those more innovative, faster moving, hungrier participants come in and, and play, yeah. And, and, and one thing to add to that, so we, can, we don't have much time for questions, but one thing to add to that is that because of the, of the nature of trying to get these systems to integrate and the cost involved, um, the purchasing decision for a system to enter into a school district is done at the highest of high levels that they can do it, right? So it's, it's done at the district or the state level. And part of opening this market up and the fractured market is trying to push that buying decision as low down as we possibly can into hopefully the point where the school or even the teacher is making that purchasing decision. Right? And so that's a big step, right? Having, having the people that are actually on the ground impacting student outcomes directly making the purchasing decision, which is a crazy idea, but it's got to happen, right? So that, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get there. So That's the dream. That's the dream. Oh, sorry, one last thing. What's next? So uh, you know, we're expanding out our user level uh, authorization, uh, taking it even deeper. The, uh, the, the, the API provides that centralized point of authorization, which is really important. Um, but we're going to take that even deeper. Um, Nebraska, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, in addition to Tennessee, are already on the way to implementing this platform. Other states to follow, they all face these same pains, right? Whether they implement this platform um, or something else, they're all trying to address these problems. Single sign-on, centralized data store, interoperability of applications, reducing the switching costs, um, you know, trying to, trying to fix the market. Um, Richard uh, in Tennessee was a forward thinker, a trailblazer, and so he was ahead of the market, and this vision, um, set off some triggering events that had these other states jumping onto it. Um, the other thing to add is that instead of just going looking at the states, there are districts that want this as well. They would love to have a single sign-on. They would love to have this infrastructure. And they don't want to wait for the state to make up their mind to sign something to put this into place. The district will move faster than the state will a lot of times. And so that's, that's our next push.